Good afternoon. It is my pleasure today to introduce our first distinguished speaker of the year, Ms. Janet Fowdy. Janet is chair of the board of Deloitte. She's also a member of Deloitte's global board of directors and chair of Deloitte Foundation. Before taking on the position as chair, she served as CEO for Deloitte Consulting and previously led the firm's federal and technology practices. With her impressive knowledge, Janet regularly engages executive level audiences about the evolving business landscape, tech disruption, and leadership. Among many other things, she's a remarkable figure in the nonprofit space. She's on the board of Bright Pink and Catalyst, which focus on women's health and advancement into leadership positions. Janet and her husband, Kent, support charities not only through giving, but also by regularly participating in 5K races despite their busy schedules. <laughs> they have a goal of running one 5K per month whenever Chicago weather permits. <laughs> now, Janet, in case you haven't heard, as part of our FICWA tradition, all of us were asked to share 25 random things about ourselves during the admissions process. <laughs> so today, I'm honored to take on the task of sharing two random yet fascinating facts about Janet. <laughs> First, she is a comic book character. Deloitte entered into a fun and collaborative comic book initiative with the Ella Project called Ella the Engineer to encourage young girls to pursue STEM education. And as part of the collaboration, Janet was turned into a comic book character in the inaugural issue to help Ella solve a problem using STEM skills. I bet none of you saw that coming. <laughs> Second, Deloitte developed a business chemistry assessment framework which helps identify people's working styles. Janet is a pioneer integrator, which means she seeks possibilities and connections that are key to bringing teams together. Now please join me and give Janet a very warm people welcome. So Janet, we're so happy to have you here. And um, I didn't know this would be my first question, but what are your comic book uh, superpowers? <laughs> I'm not running 5Ks fast, that's for sure. Um, so, so, so all humor aside, um, we were approached with this wonderful project by actually one of our clients in and around. Could we, could we create this very different way to reach young, young girls in STEM? I did not know in doing that that I would have to be interviewed by a comic book author and, uh, and, and drawn up as a comic book character. It was very, very high entertainment value for my children in particular, um, who are young 20-somethings who think it's just pretty hysterical that I'm a comic book character with all the analytical skills you can imagine for problem solving in a STEM comic book. Yeah. So, uh, so let's talk technology a little bit. And um, you, you have said that everybody needs to be conversant with technology. and. Uh, you made yourself into a tech person. You said you're not a tech person, but you ended up heading the technology practice for Deloitte. So kind of a two-part question. Number one, how did you make yourself into a tech person? And then what advice do you have for everyone in the audience about how can they be sufficiently techy to s survive and thrive in the world today? Excellent, great topic, and one that is definitely near and dear to my heart. Um, so I have, um, over the last sets of years, really evolved my own thinking around technology. Um, we started in this conversation um, in and around every company being a technology company. That really came from a place for me. When I ran our technology business, we were struggling with being branded. Um, within Deloitte, actually, probably more so in the market. And so I came up with this tag phrase that really worked, which was business-led, technology-enabled. And that was a core to how we really repositioned our technology practice, business-led, technology-enabled. And as I came out of doing a bunch of other jobs in between when I was running the technology practice and when I came to be the CEO of Deloitte Consulting, I had the opportunity to present. But as I was trying to think on my feet in that session, I came up with this idea and this construct um, that we are now technology led to enable the business. And it was an entire flip from less than a decade ago where we were. So the evolution of every company is a technology company, which then led me to the place to your question, which is every career is a technology career. And now as I've transitioned into the boardroom, I'm helping lead the conversation around um, every board needs to be technology savvy and be positioned to be 
um, a technology board, so to speak. So that being said, I'm not a technologist by background, but I did have, a, um, I did have my, my field and my education was very analytical. Early in my career serving clients on Wall Street, um, the really interesting, most complex, sophisticated problems were all in and around how to essentially reinvent the back and middle office of Wall Street, and that was all being done through technology. And so I very quickly became a, a, a student really um, in a very different manner, I think, than you would today because the tools and methods for studying and learning something quickly didn't exist. Um, there was no, nothing even close to the online learning and conversations we were able to have to learn. So I became a fairly classic apprentice, which is I apprenticed myself to people who um, had studied and worked in the field over time. Um, that's one thread. Maybe most important is I became a really good listener. And my role in technology was I would never be the deepest technologist. I'm not an engineer by training. I became a really good listener. And the ability to translate what was happening in the business to what the technologist needed to do and vice versa is really how I sort of created my space. If you flash forward, I, I, you all are living in a very, very different time in a different place. And the ability for each of you to understand the technology issues that are affecting the organizations that you're going to work for, the clients that, are, that you're going to serve if you're in professional services, there's such a, a, almost an embarrassment of riches. Um, I do think it is staying incredibly tuned in and being attentive to the technology topics that are affecting um, your businesses, your organizations, your clients, um, your domains, uh, because there is such an, uh, an incredible richness of information. It's all about how do you tune into it and not put yourself in the trick where so many people in my generation started, which is, oh, technology is somebody else's problem or somebody else's issue, as opposed to it's something that we all have to own and embrace and to be the most effective business people to understand how technology applies to the business problem you're solving um, I think is critical. Yeah. So as companies go through these technology transformations, uh, does that increase or decrease the demands on leadership? <laughs> um, I, and maybe this is a biased point of view, but I think um, leading organizations through large, complex technology and digital transformation puts very intense pressure on leadership for a bunch of reasons. Um, one is because you're often, um, at the most macro business level, often solving a problem that has not been solved before. You know, the technology problems that were solved over the last mm, probably 15 years were sort of known in, in corporate America, and I'll just use corporate America as a proxy for large, complex organizations. We were talking about known problems with relatively known solutions, and they were still messy and hard. Anyone who's lived in engineering or technology knows large, complex projects and programs with technology underpinning them are hard. What we're finding today is the work that we're doing helping our clients is often, sometimes it's a well-defined problem without a clear answer. Often it's an ill-defined problem with an ill-defined answer. So the amount of innovation and creativity and discipline in running and driving a large technology transformation is significant. So that's one bucket of things. But the other bucket of things is the talent um, and change manage management dimensions of large technology transformations. Um, I spend a lot of time um, serving clients across a variety of industries, but I'm spending a lot of time now in Silicon Valley, primarily focused on our, go to, our Deloitte's go-to-market relationships um, with the likes of, um, well, you can imagine, Google, Amazon, Apple, pick, pick your favorite. Um, but we also have the privilege to serve, to serve those organizations as clients. Um, and I will tell you that the change management um, in their large, complex, sophisticated organizations is no less hard than it is in our organization, in any organization. So change is hard. The, the human nature dimension of change is hard, even in the most sophisticated, leading edge um, organizations in the market today. So I'm, I'm happy to hear there's still a, a role for people in these technology transformations. <laughs> If just, it would be so easy. Yeah. So um, as, you, as you have observed these companies that are remaking themselves as technology companies, you, you have labeled some as fast adopters and some as slow adopters. Um, and like the classic fable of the tortoise and the hare, 
you actually make the argument that it may be the slow adopters that ultimately win the race. Why is that? Letting um, both the technologies and the definition of the problem settle in just a little bit, I believe, can create a very different momentum for organizations. Um, and, and to be clear, being at the back of the pack is not a good place to be in this day and age, but being absolutely on, you know, we, we don't use that expression as much these days, bleeding edge and leading edge, but being one step or two steps behind the bleeding edge, creating the time and space for the market to evolve just a smidge um, can, I believe, create um, a, 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 enough space to really differentiate your position now, there's places where you all clearly know that being first to market with a product and asset can be very differentiated, but you also know that you can learn a lot. The same applies to how you think about digital transformation and technology transformation. So I wanna to switch to, to people topics uh, rather than technology. And the, the first question is that I know you're a, a very strong advocate of courageous conversations. Um, why do you think they're so important? <laughs> So, so I've not seen these questions, which I love. Um, we, uh, we, we've moved within Deloitte um, to using um, Ask Me Anything um, as a way to have our, our conversations with our people, which I love because I have no idea what questions are coming and it's so much more fun. But in full transparency in the hallway, you and I did talk just a little bit, a little bit about this and I think we share this idea. Um, courageous conversations um, which it, at its simplest is being fearless about having really direct conversations, but in a very gracious and thoughtful manner. Um, I guess at its core, I most fundamentally believe that being straightforward with people um, in and around, being straightforward with people in a well-informed manner around the things that are that you think are important that they know is actually the kindest gentlest and most humane thing to do. Um, I've, I've watched and been part of situations where it's just easier to kick the can down the road and not have the courageous or tough conversation. And that's everything with um, one of my partners, to a member of my team, to a client, um, and the ability to be direct and clear and straightforward in a gracious manner and help, help the situation advance to a better end state. It sounds very sort of motherhood and apple pie. I guess I live in the Midwest, so I have a little bit of that in my DNA, but I do believe truly, truly creates the best outcomes. And I was not, well, I was born this way because I shared with a few of you earlier today um, I'm the daughter of a scientist and an artist, and I do think how you're raised very much forms you. Um, and, and I lived in the heart of courageous conversations because my dad used to say to us, my, I have a younger sister and I at the dinner table, if we were chattering on about something that was not of interest to him, he would say, girls, let's be clear, this conversation has lost whatever little interest it once ever had. <laughs> so think about that. Who says that to nine and 11 year old girls, right? And so that was, he was being courageous and clear. Did it up our, our dinner table conversation game? Absolutely. But setting that aside, um, I was, had just taken over running the technology business for Deloitte and Gartner, the third party analyst, I'd, I'd um, commissioned a study from them to give us feedback on us. And they do all, you know, the rankings and the quadrants and all that good stuff. But I wanted something that was just for us. And so they went and interviewed a bunch of our clients and they had all the research they'd done on us and they came back, and this was probably eight or nine years ago, and they said, you know, the greatest thing about you um, is that your clients love working with you. They love working with you. And they love that you're actually nice people to work with. However, that niceness is a double-edged sword. And what they put pressure on me on is that what we found is that our people were not being as direct with our clients around what we really thought. And our clients were coming back and saying, listen, we're paying you to be really clear about what you think, not to be our friends. And so that was a very clear market example. I tend to think about courageous conversations around people, um, you and I giving each other feedback, having a tough conversation. At the end of the day, I believe it's the right thing to do with our clients um, for, the, for the service that we provide to them, and it's the right thing to do from a humanity perspective. So I, I do it only sometimes with my children, for the record. I'm not quite as direct as my father was with me. That's OK. Um, so, so I- uh, Years of therapy I, bills avoided this way. Yeah. So uh, 
you, you are a b big believer in the idea that a great team is going to beat a great individual. And so one of the things you mentioned earlier today is that one of the most important things you will do with a leader is building your teams. So what advice do you have around what are the key things mm -hmm. that you try to do or look for in building your teams? Many of us will be in situations, especially early in your career, where you don't get to pick your team. So advice on picking your team, I think, is probably pretty common sense, right? You find um, the, the people that complement you and challenge you the most. You find the people that you believe have the a shared vision of common outcome, but not necessarily the same way you get from here to there. Um, and, and you know, I, I, as the daughter of a scientist, I'd be remiss if in all that you still did not look for the smartest people you could possibly find and smart having a wide variety. I have twins, so I always say there's lots of kinds of smart. And so you can use smart because you, you can't tell one twin they're smarter or not as smart as the other. Um, so, uh, so as smart as you can. So, but in some ways that's the easy part because the hard part, especially in the complexity of today's market, um, in today's business environment, is the things that you will tackle. Um, we, we were just, we had a wonderful conversation around the things that surprise us about our jobs each and every day that we never would have imagined that we were doing and that we certainly wouldn't believe that we had the expertise or the confidence to do. I believe you all will find that much early in your careers. I don't want to paint you with the exact same um, brush as I, um, but much, much earlier in your careers um, than those of us in the next generation did. Um, and so how you build your team and how you build commitment in your team, I believe, is the most important. I, I don't think there is um, the, the fundamental truth that I have found to be true is the level of commitment and investment. And investment can take a lot of different shapes that you make in, that you make in your team. And the expression I used with a cohort earlier today is that your team knowing that you'll walk over glass for them and you will do whatever it takes to help them be successful. And success can have a variety. Success, by the way, includes success on the work that you're doing together, but success can mean a lot of things. But that you are laser focused and really clear on what will help make them successful and that they know, that they know that you would walk over glass to help them that, in my mind, is the fundamental truth about building teams. I can tell you, assuredly, assuredly, I would not have the privilege of this amazing set of experiences I've had to have and to get to be in front of this incredible cohort of the next generation of leaders today if I hadn't done that one really simple thing of my teammates knowing how far I would go for them. Because, of course, then in turn, and it's one of those classic, I feel like in business, everything is the right thing to do and good for business. It is the right thing to do for your teams. And it is the classic pay it forward and pay it forward again and again and again and again. Um, I was a young mother, um, and I was a newly promoted senior manager. And I had a really complicated project that I had sold um, that was local. It was in town. It was in Chicago. And for me, that was absolutely critical. Um, and for me, staying based in Chicago, really important, probably uh, probably the other reason I'm still here um, with you today in this role, is for me, jumping on an airplane with newborn twins um, and a husband who was capable, but, 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 um, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. Is this how many, how many butts are you going <laughs> to? <laughs> it was not in the cards. So I'd sold this very complicated front end project. And that was the watershed moment for me that I realized I, I, was, I was a good team person. I always had good teams around me. That was sort of a natural part of my DNA. But that was my aha moment, which is if I could deliver this project well, um, this could be um, absolutely um, a wonderful livelihood for a whole bunch of people. We could help transform this client. And oh, by the way, it would keep me um, being able to sleep in my own bed every night and being able to care for my newborn twins in a very different way than I would if I was on a plane, which is important to me and my family at the time. And so I created a team at this client uh, this year. So that was, um, we started that project 
oh, well, my kids are 22. Um, we started it when they were three. Um, and it, we ended up doing eight years of work for this client. Um, this year, we'll make our 31st and 32nd partner in Deloitte out of that project. And so it is, and by the way, they, it was, I handpicked some of them, many of them, you know, I inherited along the way. Um, but the dynamic of that team taught me more about, more about leadership and my commitment to them was, my commitment to them was absolutely why um, that project was wildly successful, um, that set of clients went on to do really wonderful things, and that set of people went on to do really wonderful things, and created a wonderful platform for me um, as a byproduct, so. So a, a critical part of, uh, of having a great team is that people feel included, and you have been committed throughout your career towards building an inclusive culture so short of walking over broken glass uh, to show your commitment. I'm just over a broken foot, so I shouldn't be doing that right now anyway. Yeah. What, what is it that, that you have learned over time in terms of some of the key things, the key behaviors that you can share with, with people here around how to really build an inclusive culture? Yeah, so some of it we've actually talked a little bit about today. Um, some, of, some of it is about being really straightforward with people. Um, some of it is really simple, really simple things like asking them what matters to them um, and really listening to that and figuring out how to include that in how you frame their work, how you carry conversations with them, how you move the conversation along. Um, some of it is um, some of it is doing things that aren't in your best interest. So some of it is helping people transition off to do other things when that's what they want. It's I can't believe I'm even going to say this in a public setting. It's like, you know, if you love it, set it free. What's that expression? So, I mean, some of it is that. Some of it is giving people space. If you can't give them something, not holding on for dear life, even though it could help you in the short term be more successful. So there's those sets of things um, sort of at their foundation in terms, of, um, in terms of how you treat people. But then there's all about how you do the work. And I'm a big believer in, um, in, in really... Um, allowing people to stretch and push and go beyond what they're comfortable and confident in doing. And I do think, you know, we, we had a wonderful conversation on inclusion um, earlier this afternoon, but um, being fearless about giving people the space to try things that they're, they don't have the utmost confident, uh, the confidence that they can do, um, your confidence in them helps them rise to the occasion in a very different way, especially if they, um, come from a place where they don't come naturally with a lot of swagger and confidence around the topic. So those are, those are some, some of the things that I've had the privilege to do. Maybe what underscores all of that, um, maybe what underscores all of that is being a really good listener um, and being a really good listener to the people on your team. Um, you know, you, we, you talk about context clues in being um, a great consultant and listening to your client. Um, but the same thing applies, I believe, to building a great team um, is really listening to what matters for the, to them and being really tuned into that conversation. Yeah. So you, you've developed some theories about leadership or, uh, or pillars of leadership from a, a personal point of view. And, and over time, you've accumulated 10 of these leadership pillars. I want to ask you about one in particular, which is, um, I'm going to quote you, how you do anything is how you do everything. <laughs> and so can you explain what that means and, and tell us how that turned into one of your key leadership yeah. pillars? So let me just talk for a nanosecond about leadership pillars. So I am, um, I am not a deeply introspective, um, right how you lead, I will tell you, um, with all total respect for the esteemed faculty here, I do skim business books. I do not read every line in every business book. I do skim to get to the essence on occasion. Um, and I've never written down how I think about leadership in my life. And I was up for the role to be CEO of Deloitte Consulting. And um, I did not have a relationship with the main person who was making that decision. And as, as I was thinking about my business case for this job, and there were a bunch of people in the mix, there were five or six people in the mix for this job. Um, obviously, um, the things that I've done, the businesses that I've built, um, the teams that I've had the privilege of lead and build were important. 
but I thought it was really important that this person understand how I lead, because I do believe that one of the key criteria for being a great CEO is leadership. So I took pen to paper and I wrote my 10 principles. Then some of my close friends um, who are fearless about telling me what they think go, yeah, that sounds good, but you don't really do that um, for some of them. And then, but they also added some um, that were uh, incredibly gracious. So I started with these 10. And so that was five, uh, about five and a half years ago. But they've evolved. And as I've continued to mature, as the market has changed, um, as how I lead has changed, there are things that I've taken off the page. And as my roles have changed, there are things I've taken off the page and things I've added to the page. So you happen to pick on one that I've added relatively recently. So um, I had the privilege a couple of years ago for any baseball fans in the audience of interviewing Theo Epstein, um, the, the obviously um, baseball manager of the Red Sox and then my, my near and dear Chicago Cubs. And he shared that line with me when he was talking about one of his players. And the line that he used was his player was as committed in a charity event and engaging um, with, um, with youth on the baseball field as he was practicing his swing in the off season, as he was at spring training when he was at risk at whether he was going to stay on the team. Every interaction he had had the same level intensity and clarity and directness. And that really resonated with me. As I thought about it as leader, as a leader, no matter what level you are in an organization, and I talk to my consultants about this all the time because they are the ambassadors and the brand for Deloitte, right? We don't have um, a device um, or a brand that sits on a restaurant. Our people are our brand that the way you carry yourself in every interaction that you have absolutely defines who you are as a person and as a leader. I've actually started thinking about it as it applies to my personal life as well. So it's about that consistency. It is, do you treat um, the checkout person in a store the same way you would treat a colleague that you met on the street um, as you would treat an administrative assistant? Um, as you would treat, um, as you would treat someone in your family, just in terms of the way you carry yourself and and how you interact. And so I, I really do believe that, especially especially in the marketplace that we're in, and in the world that has so much clutter and confusion and noise, the way that we carry ourselves and the consistency with which we carry ourselves and the authenticity with which we carry ourselves um, can make a big difference in terms of how we lead. Okay. So that's the backstory, and that's a little bit about how I think about that topic. Okay. And I challenge myself all the time on that, because that is a, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, so I hold it up as a virtue um, and something that I aspire to and I challenge my teams to do. Um, but I also know it's extremely hard to do in the moment of the everyday chaos mm -hmm. of our life. So one of the things that, that you've done is you've identified that People talk about mentors all the time, but you've, you, you say it, you have mentors and sponsors. And so the question I have is, why can't one person be both a mentor and a sponsor? And then more importantly, how do you get someone to be your mentor or sponsor? Good, 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 good topic. Um, first of all, I would say that um, you, someone absolutely can't, could be a mentor and and a sponsor. I have people over the course of my career who've been mentors and sponsors. Um, uh, mentor, someone who gives you advice, unsolicited or not, by the way, um, a little bit to how do you get them. Um, but, but with that advice does not come investment except for the coffee or the glass of wine or the dinner that they might have bought you or you might have bought them. So the price of mentorship, except for time and the coffee, is, is, is free. And I'm not trying to imply at all that mentoring relationships are, uh, are trivial because they're not, because you can learn a lot in a mentoring relationship. My anxiety about mentoring relationships is twofold. One ties to sponsorship and one doesn't. I'll talk about the one that doesn't tie to sponsorship first. Um, I've talked a lot about um, some personal things, both in how I talk about leadership and even in this conversation today. And I do believe that when you think about mentoring, you, 
you're not, I mean, there are technical mentors who will help you solve a technical problem in your job, but we're talking about people who help mentor you in and around your career, the decisions you make, how you handle a complex situation, how you think about how your life and work are going to evolve together, those types of topics, as opposed to a more technical mentor. Um, those things are really personal. And the idea that, and, and this took me a long time to come to, that I would be bold and confident enough to know that the advice I would give to any one of you as I was mentoring you has to be viewed as a, through, a, through your lens of what's very personal and what worked for me or what might have worked for the 100 other people I saw in that situation may or may not work for you because these decisions are really personal. Sponsorship, however, is around a relationship where one puts their political capital on the line to help you and advance your agenda, your career, the direction of the things that you're trying to accomplish. Truly think about that. Put your political capital on the line to advance the conversation. So most people have a lot of mentors and a lot of mentoring relationships and a handful of sponsors and a handful of sponsoring relationships because each of us only has so much political capital to put on the line regardless of what your role or title or energy is. And so I do think they're very distinct and different roles. Um, I also have found, um, and now you're giving me a chance to use something that I wanted to say on a panel I was on a couple weeks ago and we ran out of time and I'm sure we'll run out of time here soon so I'll keep it brief, is I do think you can, you can ask someone to mentor you um, I still think it's a little bit awkward, um, but you can. Um, and I do still to this day get calls where people ask if, if they will, um, if I can mentor them. I think mentoring is more organic. I think if you say, I've got this complex problem I'd like your help with, people are generally helpful and they will want to help you. You don't have to ask for the formal relationship. Sponsoring, much more tricky because it's about what each person gives up in terms of political capital or investment into the relationship. And so sponsorship is something that really is earned. And you know, I talked earlier today with one of the cohorts I met with about space fillers. You know, someone who reaches in and grabs problems that they see that no one else is tackling. Um, you know, I, I tend to sponsor people who are space fillers because I see a lot of goodness in that. I, see spon I sponsor people who I think don't have quite the edge that other people might have because of whatever reason they're not getting that extra edge or energy or push. And I think if they just had that um, from me, that would make a huge difference and this person's career can accelerate. But the funny part of the story is, and maybe um, I, we have a very diverse audience here, for those of you not raised in this country might not know this book um, called um, Are You My Mother? Um, and will you be my mother? And that is, it's a children's book and there's a, I think it's a duckling that's lost his mother. And so he goes to all these animals and say, would you be my mother? And whenever someone calls me and asks, would you be my sponsor? That's all I can think of. I'm like, <laughs> would you ask me to be your mother? I don't think so. Um, so anyway, it, it always cracks me up and it brings me back to um, random parenting stories, but that's what I think of. So. Mentorship, you should just ask for the help and advice and counsel that you need. And you can tell someone else, oh, that person's my mentor without having an official stamp of approval that they've said they can be your mentor. Sponsorship is earned um, through, through relationship and trust and confidence. Okay, I'm gonna ask you one more question and then turn it over to the audience. So you have characterized your career as highly nonlinear. From the perspective of an outside person, what, what would you say is the biggest surprise in terms of a choice you made in your career? And underneath it, what, what is it that motivates you to make those choices, those nonlinear choices? Well, I have to be a little bit careful. I, maybe I was quoted at some point, you've done your homework clearly at nonlinear because I have been at the same organization for 28 years. So that's only, you can only be so nonlinear, but I have gotten <laughs> to do a very wide variety of things within the organization. Um, the thing that's probably surprised me the most um, is how gracefully um, I've been able to make the choices about how my personal and professional life have been able to intersect. Um, every, I, I could say I have a complicated personal life, but everybody has a complicated personal life. I mean, we were talking earlier about one of your students who has seven children. Okay, that's a really complicated personal life. Um, I have two children. Um, I, I'm a breast cancer survivor. I have a daughter with some complex health issues. You know, I have an amazing mother, um, but who is, um, who, who is aging. I have complicated issues in my nieces and nephews, right? 
everyone has complicated personal lives. Um, and how gracefully I've been able to um, create the space and time to do really meaningful things professionally and feel like I've been there um, and had the energy and um, commitment for my family um, through all those crazy twists and turns is probably the thing that surprised me the most. Um, and those choices have not been, have not been hard choices. And so I, I, I do think that um, we can spend, we collectively as a society can spend a lot of hand, time hand wringing around choices. Um, and you know the right choice, um, I think it's actually all about how you show up. Um, and you all are, and maybe this would have been my closing comment, but I have to dash right at the bottom of the hour because otherwise I will not be in San Francisco tomorrow for a commitment that I've made. Um, and you can tell my answers tend to be a little long and rambling. So um, I will close with this in case we don't have time to close at the end of the session, which is you all are at an unbelievable institution at an unbelievable point in time. Um, I, I have to say I'm a little jealous um, at the moment in time that each of you sit here um, today for the environment that you get to learn and grow in and how you get to take that forward into the most complex and the, the most challenging um, environment, certainly, I believe, of our collective generation. And you really, I, I don't believe, can make a bad choice to that end. I do believe it is about how you show up um, and how you, how you take on the things that are in front of you and how you navigate the twists and turns um, of where, wherever you show up. And that's choices about what to major in, where to do your internship, um, where to uh, launch the next phase of your career, what city to live in. There, there are not a set of right and wrong answers on um, how you show up against all those choices. Um, is I believe what will what will define success um, for each of you, and that's very much how I retrospectively now think about my career. I wasn't nearly that clever to begin with. So, okay, fantastic. Questions from the floor. Hi, Janet. Thanks for being here. I've really enjoyed hearing from you today. Um, my question is around being a woman in a position of leadership. Um, Business schools like Fuqua are lauded for accepting um, more and more women um, than ever before, which we're really proud of. Um, and yet, the percentage of women in positions such as yours hasn't changed much over the last 20 years. Um, recognizing that women such as yourself are probably asked this question more disproportionately than men, and there's probably no secret sauce, how do you lead conversations within Deloitte and with your clients um, and in the position of influence that you hold um, just in in the workplace um, broadly around thinking about um, championing women and changing that statistic? So I think the good news is um, that I've come into these roles at actually a time where the conversation has changed a lot. Um, and the engagement of the broad business community in that conversation has changed a lot. We did, we, when I started my career, that was, you know, and I was, you know, in, in, in and around technology on Wall Street, that could not have been further from the conversation ever, 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 ever. Um, so, so leading the conversation actually today is, um, is, is, it's not a hard conversation. The business case, and I don't want to talk just about women, the business case for um, inclusive teams, inclusive tables, and inclusive environments is super clear. Um, and there's been study and study and study. The hard part is how do you change the culture and the behavior of organizations uh, while everyone's moving a million miles an hour? And that's really the hard conversation. Um, the case for change is easy and straightforward. The complex conversation is how do you make sure that you are changing the culture and how you're putting the mechanisms in place to support changing the culture through all the twists and turns that we're seeing in our business environment, in our political environment, in the market writ large, that's the, that's the piece that's tricky. And that's the place where I'm really trying to lean in um, and have a meaningful conversation. I mean, that's everything from boardrooms to executives to government, right? That's a transcendent conversation, which is how do you have, uh, how do you create a long-standing inclusive environment so that we get to the place where we're not talking about it anymore. But I can tell you the openness to the conversation, um, and, and the reality is it's because um, employees, 
consumers and various constituents are putting that pressure into the system, rightly so. And so it's created that case for change in a very different way um, than it was before. It doesn't make the topic easier to solve, but creates the space for the conversation um, to be much, there, there is a lot more space for the conversation for sure. And the biggest change I would say over the last couple of years is introspection. Um, and there, I would say, is more introspection in the conversations today, which I think is, is a really important attribute in the change conversation as well. Thank you. Great, great topic. Other questions? I'm not going to tell your dean that I hold a competition between business schools. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, just a little bit quietly. Hi, Janet. Thanks for coming. Um, you spent part of your career leading the federal practice at Deloitte and then, were, and then have been sort of involved across consulting. Um, in our advanced corporate strategy class that a lot of the second years are taking right now, we have a lot of discussions about the difference between um, what government is responsible and what business is responsible for. Having had experience advising clients in both spaces, mm. how do you see that? Um, how do you see that interaction changing? And and where do you think the kind of happy medium is for government and for business to solve some of the biggest challenges <laughs> that we face? <laughs> that in six minutes or less. So um, so great to great great super important topics. You might win business school question of the year so far this year. That that actually I think is the best question that I've gotten across. A, a wide set of your um, colleagues across the country. Um, so, so a couple quick things. So one is there is no doubt um, that um, collaboration, um, two things. One is collaboration between business and government is at a record high um, requirement. There is no doubt that our governments do not have unto themselves the wherewithal to solve the transcendental issues of our time, nor should they. And business has to step in. Um, and that, that is a, takes a wide variety of forums in terms of how those get solved. I'm not sure I'm clever enough to know where that equilibrium is. Um, and, I, and I wish I had a crystal ball to that end. But there's no doubt that, that we are. I don't believe we're at the right e equilibrium um, for where we are today. But I think it's super sensitive, because I do also think a lot about, um, so I'll pick a super simple example. I'll think about parks. So public parks. So public parks, super important, right? I think super important um, to our communities, to our families. Um, and so a lot of corporations have been creating public park space, which is absolutely, and I'm picking a non-controversial topic on purpose. Um, but that's wonderful, and they're beautiful parks. But then you think, well, what happens when that corporation, we, we, you all know better than I, how quickly companies come in and out of the Fortune 500, how co quickly companies um, can get created and disappear. What happens when that, when that organization goes away? What happens to that park? So I do think a lot about those things. Um, and so I, I think uh, with that as sort of a funny, simple example, but I think um, the balance of truly what will transcend what we need as, as country and society balanced with the expertise and energy and capital that business has to give is important. But I'd be remiss if I didn't say that consulting to the federal government, which was a relatively short um, period of my career, I did that for about three years, and I did go from Wall Street there, which was enough to make your head want to spin. Um, the level of complexity of issues that we as an organization get to help the federal government solve are second to none. Now the process to get from ideation to helping solve those is enough um, to, to make you absolutely crazy and it's, it's designed to be slow and intentional um, because it's all of our money um, that the government is spending. But the level of complexity and sophistication of the problems that we help our federal government clients are the most sophisticated and complicated and interesting problems that we solve. And so I know that sounds a little bit counterintuitive. It's very easy um, to sort of take a very simple lens. But when you think about the sophistication of the topics, they are very, very high and very rich. So that's just a little, um, a little quick commercial for um, the interesting problems um, that are you know, th think about from defense to intelligence to military health um, to the State Department, think about the complexity of issues those agencies solve on our, uh, the CDC solve on our collective behalf, our wonderful set of problems. So a little sidebar from your question, but I thought important to note. 
Okay, we have time for one last question before we close things down. Okay. Hi, Janet. Thanks again for being here. Um, the topic of success is on my mind because I've constantly defined and redefined what that definition means for me, especially being in this space. And so I'm curious, I know you mentioned um, the things that have been most surprising to you through your journey. Um, so when all is said and done, how would you define success for yourself like through this incredible journey that you've had? Yeah. Um, great question, and it ties so nicely back um, to one of the questions that um, that Dean Boulding asked me, um, my success is absolutely um, is absolutely two things, and and outside of my family. Okay, so that's don't tell them I didn't say that first. Um, so one is the success of the people that um, I've had the privilege to have on my teams, um, and how they've navigated their career and the impact they have, and how many lives um, they've helped create and touch to their clients and their organizations. The second for me in this time, and th so that's, by the way, that's been my success criteria forever. That and my family have been my success criteria forever. Where I find myself today is my success is not about any one strategy that Deloitte takes forward or any of my clients take forward. How I view success today is can I help create a truly agile organization? Um, and can I create an organization that is really comfortable with the pace and the amount of change that is going to be ad infinitum? Um, and so, you know, there's a couple of, just a couple of my team members here who are probably laughing. They're like, oh, that's why she's torturing so much with all this change, is I really um, have tried to work to get, and I did this in my client organizations as well, how to get them used to change, not for change sakes, all for the better, but how do I get the organization comfortable with being really agile and get comfortable both as, in, as individuals and as organizations with change? Because I don't think, um, you know, I talked about the unprecedented time you're here. I don't believe that the pace and the intensity of how quickly um, and how interesting the world is going to move is going to slow down anytime soon. So that's also how I define success is whether I've created um, organizations and um, culture and DNA and infrastructure um, that allow the organization to morph and evolve with the market and the people with it. So, okay, thank you. Um, appreciation oh, for Janet. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Janet.